Welcome to the Highland Waves podcast, coming to you from Marshbrook Studios, situated on a bank of the Marguerite River in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, Canada. At Highland Waves, we feature stories about the people, the places, and the visitors of Inverness County. I'm Pat Wall, your host. This morning, I'm pleased to have with me in the studio, Mr. Liam O'Rourke. Welcome to Highland Waves, Liam. Thanks for having me. Liam is General Manager of Larchwood Enterprises, a local company that manufactures products from larch trees, and is also situated on a bank of the Marguerite River. Liam, you're relatively new to Marguerite and to Larchwood? Yeah, so I uh, arrived here in the community about three years ago um, and took over for a lovely gentleman, Don Beamish, uh, who had run the company essentially from its existence. Um, and uh, I do have uh, connections to the community that go back a ways further than that. My, uh, my wife would be part of the Cody clan. Um, so, okay. uh, uh, you know, a family that's been an institution in the, in the community here for a long time. Speaking of institutions, looking at your name, Liam O'Rourke, it's not hard to figure out where your ancestors came from. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a good Irish name, I'd yeah. say. Yeah. Were you born in Ireland? I was not, no. Oh. Um, my... Uh, my dad's family immigrated uh, from Ireland, or actually from the UK, um, uh, just after the war. So half of my dad's family would have been born overseas, and half of them were born here in Nova Scotia. Okay. And you were educated in Nova Scotia? Yep. I, uh, I grew up, I, I'm originally from North Sydney, but grew up outside okay. of the, uh, um, the city there in Halifax. Um, and yeah, went to school out there and went to school in Halifax. Yeah, I, I was doing a little research, and... Uh, you have degrees in kinesiology mm -hmm. and uh, neuroanatomy. Uh, I, I did a specialization in neuroanatomy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, kinesiology, we all associate with sports and movement and function. And neuroanatomy is relegated to the brain and, and, and the brain activity. How do these help you in your job at, as a manager at, uh, at Flashwood? Truthfully, the the degrees that I took, I took because I was on a path at that point in my life to going to medical school. Um, uh, at that point, uh, um, yeah, I, I would say that the degrees I took in university aren't overly related to my day-to-day -day job at this point. I mean, the skills I learned, like, you know, um, writing, uh, researching, things like that, um, those are obviously applicable. Um, but yeah, the day-to-day -day, uh, running of Larchwood doesn't have a whole lot to do with kinesiology or neuroanatomy. So oh, yeah. yeah, I was just wondering whether yeah. they had any uh, help to you in your in your daily. No, the uh, the the way I ended up in sort of leadership roles in organizations was as a uh, um, a student waiting to get into uh, medical school. Um, I started a company in Montreal that happened to be a nonprofit. Um, and a non-profit, it was an enterprising non-profit, I guess you would say, um, and I ran that for about 12 years uh, and grew that company to a pretty decent size. Um, so um, the reason I started that, though, was because um, I had been working with a de demographic in, in, I was living in Montreal at the time, um, working with uh, uh, individuals on the autism spectrum. Okay. Um, and we actually started exploring media production. So we were doing video and audio production with uh, autistic youth and saw a, a, an untapped resource there, I guess. Uh, so we were doing creative outlet stuff for uh, youth on the autism spectrum, then also creating employment for those folks. So over, I guess, yeah, the course of about 10 years, um, that company grew to a decent size and I found myself as a manager there. Um, and then from there, I stepped into a role running another nonprofit organization uh, in Dartmouth that had a large woodworking component. And that's kind of the, the trajectory and how I got to Larchwood. Well, um, I noticed that you did uh, work at uh, a place in Dartmouth that was basically uh, a social enterprise. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was devoted to sort of integrating mentally challenged into the... the, the Individuals with mental illness, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. What's the difference in managing in that environment 
than in the management of an environment that you're currently in. I mean, the employees are different in terms of physical and, and uh, intellectual uh, capabilities, but what else is different and what, what do you have to deal with in terms of uh, your everyday work? I mean, I'd say a lot of the principles are the same, uh, you know, treating people with respect and things like that, and listening to people and trying to, um, uh, yeah, just make sure that uh, you're integrating, you know, the, the folks that work for you into the way that you run your organization. Um, I'd say probably things are a little bit less complex uh, for me here. Like there's there's different inputs to um there's there's probably less inputs to to be uh, managing at Larchwood. Um, so the last company, there was a lot of government funding. There was a lot of reporting back to fundraisers, uh, to donors, things like that. Which is that was a large component of that job. So um, in that sense, it was kind of like you know there was a a, a core business that we ran. Um, and that would be very similar to Larchwood, but on the other side of it, there was a, a social service that was being provided to the community that was funded by predominantly by the government. Um, and so there's a whole stakeholder engagement portion of that where you're dealing with managing the government who's funding you as well as managing the service that's being provided. Um, so I'd say, I mean, not to say that Larchwood is, isn't a complex organization because there's a lot of moving parts there and a lot of, uh, especially we've, we're in a big growth trajectory right now, um, but it's a bit more straightforward in that, uh, you know, we're, you know we, we're a for-profit entity that uh, manufactures a product and, and that's basically, it's pretty clear what we do. Um, we provide jobs to the community and we make a great product and sell it all over the world. How many employees do you have? Uh, the number currently, I, uh, to be honest, I couldn't tell you. We, we brought on about three new people this week. I'd say we're probably in the range of 26 right now. Okay. Um, yeah. Are these seasonal or are they? No. Uh, the only seasonal employees that we have at this point would be the folks that would work out of our kiosk, which is located in Marguerite Harbor. So we have three lovely folks that work there um, uh, from, say, June until October. But... Yeah, our core our core team right now um, we're running at around between 24 and 26 people year round. That's amazing in a yeah. small community. Of yeah. the size of uh, now we have a couple of folks that are outside of Halifax as well. We have a facility in Wolfville um, where we I mean it's just a retail facility. We sell cutting boards down there and and uh, Japanese knives. Okay. Besides your contribution in terms of salaries to the people who work for you. What are other areas does Larchwood contribute to the community? Yeah, I mean, uh, like the most direct ways I would say would be, uh, I mean, we provide slabs and kindling for people to burn in their fireplaces. Now that's, you know, we're selling that. Um, we sell it at a, I think, a pretty reasonable rate. Um, sawdust uh, is another uh, element that, uh, I mean, we have a lot of farmers that depend on us for sawdust uh, as bedding for their, uh, for their animals. Um, the employment piece, and I think um, probably one of the larger things is just bringing a piece of marguerite um, to wide reaches of the globe. Um, so, I mean, our cutting boards are being sold in, uh, across Asia, across Europe, all across North America. Um, and we hear stories all the time of folks from Marguerite or from Cape Breton that, uh, you know, ex excitedly get in touch with us and say, we saw your cutting board in wherever. Um, uh, and that's, I think that's a really, probably one of the more important things is that we've got a great community here. and We make a ma an amazing product and, um, yeah, just to bring a piece of that to Japan or to South Korea or to... Um, Germany. Um, those are that's an interesting. That's a thing to be proud of. I think. Of course. Yeah. I I'll relate a little experience I had. I was going to uh, Yellowstone National Park, mm -hmm. and I flew into Bozeman, uh, which is where the airport was, and it's about a four-hour drive from there. But in the meantime, I was aunt, my wife and I were looking around, and we went into this little shop, and we walked in, and the front was full of large wood cutting boards. <laughs> <laughs> so the lady came over, asked us, you know, if we could help if she could help us so I told her that I lived just across the street from Larchwood well it took 45 minutes to get out of there she was so excited to meet somebody from where the cutting boards were yeah. made you know it was kind of cute it must have been a big change to move from the city to a rural area yeah I suppose it was uh, I'd say um, I mean my wife and I have often uh, not have often have long uh, 
dreamed of moving to Marguerite. Um, I didn't think I would find a job here that would kind of fit my skill set. Um, so I think we always thought that it would probably be a bit of a retirement piece um, for us. Um, so when the opportunity came, it was we were pretty excited about that. Um, I think for me, the bigger adjustment was we moved from Montreal to Dartmouth uh, about, well, that would have been about seven or eight years ago. Um, and that I found to be a, a larger adjustment. We lived in Montreal for about 15 years. Um, and uh, But we had our first child in Montreal and just getting home to family was pretty important. So uh, made the move back. And that's when I ended up working with Lake City and Dartmouth. How are your family mm. blending into the rural life here now? I think, I mean, to be honest, it hasn't been that big. Uh, a sh- it hasn't been a big shock for us. Um, uh, we live actually quite remote and off grid. Um, in an area of Marguerite called Big Brook, um, and uh, so I not not for everyone, that's for sure. Um, but uh, um, we really love it. So um, I think you know I, I I really did enjoy city life, especially living in Montreal. It's a great community, really vibrant culture and things like that. Um, and I really enjoy rural life. Uh, just you know being in the woods and. Um, we've got three dogs out there. I've got two kids. You know, lots to keep me busy. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Are, there, are there challenges, especially to younger children, you know, with the uh, availability of various things? I mean, we're fortunate that our kids are, um, you know, pretty standard kids. that They don't need any special support. So um, that's, that's fortunate. Uh, you know, I mean, it would be great to have more things around. But I think the way things are going in Marguerite, there's a lot of young people coming back there's a lot of young kids here i'm involved with the school and involved with a number of things like soccer and hockey and things like that and i mean it would be great to see more activities but um at this point i mean we've got i mean our kids are quite happy with what they have available to them now i guess they don't know anything else so (laughs) um uh but no i i think it's simple it's a little simpler a little bit slower and i think that's a good thing so i could yeah Larchwood started as a flooring manufacturer. Perhaps you could give us a little background on Larchwood? Yeah, so I think even prior to that, it had started as a mill, um, and then they, they moved into manufacturing flooring at Larchwood. Um, uh, they were struggling with the, the flooring manufacturing, and particularly selling the flooring. I think they knew quite well how to manufacture it, um, and started looking at uh, um, products that could supplement that, essentially. Um, and, uh, I mean, I've heard a couple of different stories as to the, the origin story. Um, but, uh, essentially the owner of the business and a couple of the folks that were really involved in the production, um, uh, there was a, an end grain, uh, sorry, an edge grain piece that was cut out of the countertop. And in looking at that, they saw the end grain pattern and said, that's, that's what we really need to start exploring. And so, you know, prototyping and, and, uh, developing the product. I don't know exactly how long it took, but I'm going to guesstimate that it was probably about a year or two to land on uh, the first product, which is still a product we sell, which is our small original cutting board or classic small. Um, it's my favorite board still. Um, so sometimes the, you know, the first piece is the, the best piece. Um, and they've just expanded upon that. Um, and uh, so, you know, fast forward 20 years, 2003 would have been when Larchwood, uh, the cutting board manufacturing company, was established. Um, and here we are 20 years later. I haven't been able to make time or find wood to manufacture flooring because we just have had such a demand for our cutting boards. Um, uh, so we're, yeah, it's growing quite quickly. <laughs> That's big. Yeah. Well, you're certainly known for your cutting boards, and uh, perhaps you can explain uh, end grain versus edge grain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, I guess if you think about uh, like a tree in its natural format uh, in the woods, the, the grain of the wood is going to be growing from the ground to the sky. Um, if that was cut down, um, then you know the tree's lying on the ground, the edge would be running... Uh, uh, the edge of the grain would be running along the length of the tree, and the end of the grain would be what you would see at, on the stump, um, uh, or the end of the tree. Uh, so we started manufacturing in that way, um, I think at first, because it was beautiful. Um, we The grain pattern in larch is very unique, um, and uh, it gives us this really wonderful sort of palette to work with, and gives us this great, uh, great surface uh, to look at. Um, and then 
you know, all the benefits that, uh, that came from that have really, you know, propelled the business forward, which is, so the end grain cutting board, uh, or the end grain, uh, is a lot more durable. So it's a lot stronger than the edge grain, um, from a couple of different perspectives. So one in that, like when you cut into the end grain of the, um, uh, the wood, imagine your knife sliding between the grains of the wood um, versus if you're cutting into the edge of the wood, you're going to be damaging those grains every single time you do that. Um, so we call that a bit of, it's like a self-healing property of the board. So if those grains are well moisturized and well hydrated, then they'll move apart and come back together. Self-healing, um, you can cut on that board and you're not going to see your knife marks. On an edge grain board, you're always going to see a knife mark from, from every cut. They might not be super prominent, but eventually they're going to start to show up. Um, so that durability is a big thing. Um, and then one of the um, things that have has really, really propelled the business over the last, say, seven to ten years is uh, um, the edge retention that really high-end knives uh, see on our, on our cutting boards. So at this point, we still sell a lot of boards because they're beautiful. Um, I, I mean, I think most boards are sold. Be- there's a beauty element to it. Um, but a lot of our largest customers right now are uh, very high-end knife manufacturers. Not manufacturers, sorry, re- resellers. So um, Japanese knives have uh, grown in a really large way in North America over the last 10 years. And uh, and our cutting boards have been, I guess, sort of picked as one of the, the best boards, maybe the best board in North America being manufactured for use with high-end specifically like high carbon steel Japanese blades uh, because they're quite um, they're, they're quite brittle they stay they'll stay sharp for a really long time with the right surface and people find that larch wood um, as a cutting surface will maintain the edge on a, on a high-end kitchen knife and so a lot of our biggest customers are uh, really high-end knife sellers interesting yeah, yeah. Um, makes sense it does yeah. yeah yeah how long will a larch wood board last i mean if it's well cared for it can last a lifetime absolutely um i know personally i bought my first cutting board as a wedding present for someone that i didn't end up going to the wedding for um i think that was about 15 years ago um and my board is still in use every single day um i have that next to my stove and i cut on it literally every day you know, tell our listeners how they should care for their boards yeah absolutely um i mean it's quite simple We sell a conditioning product. Uh, It's a a mixture of beeswax and mineral oil. Um, So those, your cutting board just needs to be treated with that on, we say a monthly basis, but really, you know, monthly is just kind of the, 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 the standard to, to guide you. Um, If you wash it heavily, you know, condition it more. Um, If you don't wash it very heavily, then you probably can condition it a little bit less. The, the main thing is just to make sure that those wood fibers and the, the wood within the board um, is well hydrated um, and stays well hydrated. Um, that keeps it um, nice and stable, um, so you don't have any issues of uh, delamination and things like that. And then also make sure that those fibers are supple enough to to move around when a knife goes into them. Um, There's about eight types of larch. What type of larch do you use and why? So we use eastern larch and. We use Eastern Larch uh, predominantly because it was what ava- was available to us when we started manufacturing. Um, at this point, it's the Larch uh, that gives us uh, this product that is, uh, I get at this point, world-renowned. Um, so we're not going to make a shift from that. Um, we have experimented with Japanese Larch as well. Um, there's There were some test plantations of that in the Highlands um, that we did use to manufacture a couple of SKUs of cutting boards. Um, didn't see the same, uh, it wasn't as good. Um, so it was softer, it was lighter, which, you know, those are benefits in some ways, but it wasn't as durable. Um, so we never manufactured a, a quote unquote cutting board. We manufactured some serving boards, um, out of that wood. Um, I don't know all the varieties of larch. I know Siberian larch is a very popular one. Um, I don't know, I've never worked with it, so I don't know how it would, uh, interact as a, uh, as a cutting board, but, um, I know the grain pattern is something that people are really drawn to with our, um, and I know Siberian Larch doesn't have the same variety and um, interest, interesting look. Can you take us through how an end grain board is made? Uh, I can, yeah, I can do my best. Yes. Um, yeah, so, um, I mean, we, we start with logs. Um, so we, uh, we have a small bandsaw mill, um, so we, we saw everything up into a plank. 
Um, so it's a um, there's different different widths and uh, all the same thickness. Uh, so we 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 cut the wood into planks um, that you would you know recognize as they're a little bit larger, but like let's say a one by six. Um, um, we kiln dry all of our wood, so we have a kiln on site. Uh, so the kiln drying process brings that down to a moisture content that uh, is a- appropriate for what we're going to do with it. Um, from there, it's cut to length, uh, and processed through planers, uh, rip saws, and then a molding machine, which brings us to uh, um, basically the, the, the raw material of our cutting board, which is a stick um, that's uh, an inch and a quarter by three quarters of an inch. Um, and that's the building block of all of the cutting boards that we make. Um, those come in different lengths, and then they're uh, they're laminated uh, um, lengthwise um, uh, into different. Uh, we call them blanks. Um, um, we have videos of this on our website if anyone wants to check that out. Um, but yeah, so we'd have a variety of different blanks that would be um, glued up on a daily basis that would be, um, the building block of X different SKUs. So a small cutting board would be, you know, a 34 inch blank. That's 14 pieces wide, yada, yada, yada. Um, from there, those long, um, if you picture, it would be an edge grain, um, format at, at that point. So you picture long sticks that are laminated together on their edge. Um, uh, those then get cut up again, um, along the the width of it, it's hard to explain without visuals, but um, they get cut up along the, um, or I guess across the the length of that uh, that board, and they get flipped up, and that's when the edge or that's when the end grain appears, and then they get laminated together um, to have that end grain format showing up. So um, when you look at a large wood board, our sequential pattern boards, uh, you're actually looking at the same stick all the way through on on. You'll, you'll notice that the grain pattern stays the same, but it's just the same stick in, uh, um, that's been cut uh, a number of times. And then uh, glued again, and then sanding, 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 sanding. That's a big part of the process um, to get that beautiful Well, they look finish. wonderful once they're finished. Thank sure. you, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of steps in the process, yeah. though. Yeah. How and where do you obtain your wood? Uh, most of the wood is coming from Cape Breton. Um, I'd say historically, I'd pr- say probably 95% of the wood is coming from Cape Breton. Um, local harvesters uh, are uh, um, harvesting larch m- most of the time alongside black spruce for pulp and paper, um, and they bring it to us. Um, they've been doing that for years. Um, uh, we have uh, brought some wood in from the mainland, and then just this past year, we've started to look at other markets that are available to us. We're always going to buy wood from Cape Breton if it's available to us, um, but just with the growth that we're seeing, uh, um, we we just need more wood. So um, we've uh, we've started looking at New Brunswick, Quebec, and and then uh, the mainland as well. Larch is perhaps the strongest of the softwoods. That's what they say. Yeah. Um, uh-huh. I yeah. And uh, it has antimicrobial properties, mm-hmm. it's rot resistant. I was just wondering why uh, you couldn't expand into making lumber for the construction industry, siding, uh, that, all those kinds of things. Yeah, I mean, it's large in terms of siding. Absolutely, you could do that. I know we have like we have a few lifts of uh, um, large wood shingles um, that uh, that were manufactured out of our mill uh, probably ten years ago. Um, uh, so there are other products that could be made from larch. Um, at this point, we don't have the capacity to be entering into other products like that. In terms of structural lumber, larch isn't really suitable for, for structural, um, applications. It, it has a lot of, uh, it's a difficult wood to work with. Um, uh, we've gotten good at it, but it's not the simplest wood to, um, it's got a lot of natural uh, uh, torque in it, so it, it wants to twist, it wants to bend. Uh, it's not as stable as like a spruce or a fir or things like that, which are you know the standard pieces used in structural lumber. How do you market your products? Uh, I mean, the marketing, I you know, I can't really take credit for that. When I took over Larchwood, uh, I mean, we had a well-developed uh, brand, uh, so we were well known across North America. Um, historically it would have been a lot of trade shows. I've done a little bit of that. Um, and then at this point, uh, we've been starting to push, uh, some social media marketing, some things like that. So like online marketing, um, and really at this point, I think, uh, we've reached, we've kind of crested this, uh, this hill, so to speak, where, um, we don't 
actively seek out customers but at this point i'm i'm turning customers away like new wholesale clients because we don't have the capacity um you make other products though we we do and we don't i mean flooring would have been something that we do make i mean we're always happy to explore those things flooring is not something i've been able to keep in stock um at all in the last two years uh and it's I mean, unless we are looking at an expansion, we're probably not going to be able to maintain a flooring uh, product. Um, we do custom stuff as well. So uh, we do a lot of uh, custom countertops and things like that, uh, island tops. Um, that's a big part of the business. Um, and that's uh, something that we're always excited to see, um, you know, to see uh, that larch wood end grain go into really beautiful kitchens. They're uh, they're. They're a rel- I mean, they're not that pricey. They'd be comparable to a really high-end stone um, in terms of cost. Um, but we do a lot of that. Um, uh, we have some other products like uh, magnetic knife blocks. We've been experimenting with uh, butcher blocks, so large, uh, kind of an old-school product, like a large, thick uh, wooden butcher block. Um, think of other things that we have on the market right now. I mean, mostly it's... it's uh, it's cutting boards right now. That's what we're making. Um, Things must have changed after the pandemic. It created a lot of havoc for a lot of people. Uh, I'm sure that the <clears throat> methods by which people purchase products had changed. And was there a significant change in your uh, business? Yeah, absolutely. I wasn't around at the onset of the, the pandemic, but um, I think the number I heard was uh, it was an 800% growth in online sales um, in the first year of the pandemic. So, I mean, one, uh, so we, we had an inventory of product. Um, the government was uh, providing company support to pivot to online sales. So we took advantage of that. Um, and then you had people at home that were cooking. Um, and, uh, so it was just kind of a magic recipe. So we, we saw a lot of growth. Uh, we were one of the fortunate companies that really benefited probably from the pandemic. Um, it's a weird thing to benefit from, but, uh, um, I guess it's good that there were some good things that came out of it. Um, well, that was one of them. The other one is that was the, uh, in my opinion, was the, uh, impact on the medical profession and how they approached their methods of providing service to patients mm-hmm. like before the pandemic nobody ever got a phone call from the doctor yeah you know so it, it did change things for the good and yeah. thankfully larchwood was one of the recipients Absolutely. of that good fortune yeah. yeah and now i mean at this point online sales is a big portion of our business and uh, i think it's really helped grow our business as well that's um, good yeah how do you ship your product uh, we, we ship with UPS predominantly. Um, uh, so we uh, package everything on site and uh, ship from here in Marguerite all over the world. Do you use the post office? Uh, we don't currently, no. Okay. Um, yeah. I heard some rumors uh, that the post office may be either moving or uh, to another location or whatever, but I haven't heard anything definitive. So I was just wondering if it impacted your... Uh, shipping. It wouldn't impact our shipping. Uh, I think it would obviously impact us. Uh, I mean, we use the post office, just not. Uh, it's not our primary shipping. We do. We do ship things from there. There are times where Canada Post can get things out faster than UPS. Um, uh, uh, and I mean, obviously, I think it's a benefit to the community to have a post office of um, around. So uh, yeah, we'll cross our fingers that something positive can come out of that. Exactly. I've heard the same thing. Yeah. You've been in business for twenty-one years. Mm-hmm. Obviously successful and growing what do you feel are the biggest contributors to that success i'd say uh uh, probably determination um and perseverance uh um i think the product that they landed on was one that they were proud of um and they stuck through um the ups and downs of the you know the first launching a business is an extraordinarily hard thing to do um and uh um, the owner and, and don uh did a great job of just sticking with it and uh and and brought that product to a point you know where it's over the hump now and we're just i mean not coasting but uh because we're certainly not coasting we're working really hard right now but um uh yeah we've gotten to the point where we uh the product is well known the brand is solid the product is great um so we just need to keep doing what we're doing um yeah all businesses have challenges Mm mm-hmm 
And uh, what are the biggest challenges of operating a business in a small rural community like this? Yeah, I mean, labor is tough right now. Um, uh, there's a lot of changes within the community. Uh, you know, there's some uh, there's some pulls on on labor from uh, some larger businesses uh, around. Uh, you know, big scale uh, um, construction and stuff like that that's happening in the community. So that makes it tricky. Um, so finding so finding folks to work. Uh, we have a great team right now. I think you know everything ebbs and flows. Uh, we have we have some staff that have been with us for a really long time. Um, they they know us. They they trust us. They know that the job is there. It's a steady job. Um, uh, we treat people as well as we can. Um, and I yeah, but I would say labor is probably the most difficult thing. Um, next to that, I mean, we're starting to run into uh, supply chain shortages. So um, just wanting to make sure that we have wood to manufacture all the product that we need. So um, we're not, I think we'll be fine in that regard. And I think on both, both, uh, both sides, it's, uh, it's a challenge, but you know, we've overcome it. Um, yeah. Before we wrap up, anything you'd like to add? Nothing I can think of. No. Well, thank you again for coming and telling us about your products at uh, Larchwood Enterprises. And I think every member of my immediate family and others have a large wood cutting board in their kitchen. Fantastic. So good luck with uh, on every success in the future. Thanks so much. And thank you to our listeners. And the usual reminder to hit the like and subscribe button so you can stay up to date. Remember, too, that subscribing to Highland Waves is free. Our thought for today is by Johannes Brahms, the great German composer, who said, Without craftsmanship, Inspiration is a mere reed shaken in the wind. So long for now, Pat.